Thank you everyone who's joining. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, but I'm also happy to host the online group here. It gives me a lot of pleasure to introduce Jenny Sabin. Jenny E. Sabin is an architectural designer whose work is at the forefront of a new direction for 21st century architectural practice. One that investigates the intersections of architecture and science and applies insights and theories from biology and mathematics to the design of responsive material structures and ecological spatial interventions for diverse audiences. Jenny is the Arthur and Isabel B. Weisenberger Professor in Architecture and the inaugural chair for the new multi-college department of design tech, my co-chair, at the Cornell College of Architecture, Art and Planning, where she established a new advanced research degree in matter design and computation. Jenny is the principal of Jenny Sabin Studio, an experimental architectural design studio based in Ithaca and director of the Sabin Lab at Cornell AAP. In 2006, she co-founded the Sabin and Jones Lab Studio, a hybrid research and design unit together with biologist Peter Lloyd Jones. Sabin holds degrees in ceramics and interdisciplinary visual art from University of Washington and a master of architecture from the University of Pennsylvania. She was awarded a Pew Fellowship in the Arts in 2010 and was named a USA Knight Fellow in Architecture. In 2014, she was awarded the prestigious Architectural League Prize for Young Architects and Architectural Records National Women in Architecture Award. So it selected her for the 2016 Innovator in Design Award. Jenny has exhibited nationally and internationally, including in the acclaimed ninth Archilab Naturalizing Architecture in the FRAC Center in Orleans, France, and most recently as part of Beauty, the fifth Cooper Hewitt Design Triennial. Her book, Lab Studio, Design Research Between Architecture and Biology, co-authored with Peter Lloyd-Jones, was published in July 2017. In 2017, Jenny also won MoMA and MoMA PS1's Young Architects Program with her submission, Lumen. And with that, I'm really excited to hear Jenny give her talk on transdisciplinary design. Thank you so much, Wendy. Um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. It's, it's not often that I get to lecture uh, at my home campus, in my home uh, college. Uh, in fact, I think the last time I gave a public lecture was my job talk, like 12 years ago. <laughs> Um, so it's it's really a pleasure to be here. This is uh, the third installment of, for the Design Tech Lecture Series. Uh, we kicked off uh, last spring, where we featured uh, members from the faculty task force uh, that Wendy and I co-chaired, um, where we engaged collaboratively, um, taking on the groundwork, uh, which eventually became the, the new multi-college department of design tech that was launched last uh, December. Uh, in the fall, uh, we hosted um, lectures coming outside of, of the design tech uh, faculty cohort. And this spring, uh, we have again been featuring members of the newly named inaugural design tech faculty. Uh, so it's a pleasure uh, to take part in this. So tonight, I will present a working methodology and process uh, that I've cultivated collaboratively across disciplines uh, for over 18 years now. I will begin by talking about the foundation for this work, uh, where I will touch upon uh, several research projects and applied uh, built projects uh, briefly uh, to foreground that foundation. And then I will be going in depth into one research project uh, and one uh, uh, applied practice project. In many ways, transdisciplinary design uh, has never been more important. A beleaguered planet recovering from the depths of a pandemic and an urgent climate emergency upon us demand that design and technology integrate to cultivate new collaborative models and transformative, highly creative applications to comprehend key social, environmental, and technological issues. At the same time, 3D printing, advanced manufacturing, Robotics and robotics are transforming how we live, work, construct, design, do business, and engage with our communities. Recent advances in computation, visualization, material intelligence, and fabrication technologies have begun to alter fundamentally how we design, construct, and make from the nano to macro scales. For example, how might we rethink building materials through 3D printing and biologically informed design. Can buildings be made more responsive through the integration of artificial intelligence and big data? 
We are in the midst of a paradigm shift that some historians write is the biggest to impact design since the medieval period. These new intersections between the digital, the physical, and the biological are radically altering the world from the nano to macro scales. In the not so distant future, materials will not just be elements and things and buildings, they will generate immersive and regenerative adaptive structures. Like the cells in our very own bodies, sensors and living architectural materials will learn and adapt, making materials not only smart, but also cyclically engaged with local environments and resources through ecological feedback loops. To address today's pressing issues in our built and natural environments, scientists, engineers, and architects must embrace change and cultivate new collaborative design models to comprehend these key social, environmental, and technological imperatives. This requires a radical departure from traditional research models in architecture and science with a move towards hybrid transdisciplinary concepts and new models for collaboration. One approach entails the hybridization of labs and studios to fusing innovations across science and architecture to fabricate next generation architectural materials and structures that are adaptive, sustainable, and resilient. And this is a photograph taken um, during the first term of Lab Studio, uh, which I co-launched uh, with a longtime collaborator, uh, the late Dr. Peter Lloyd-Jones uh, at the University of Pennsylvania in 2005. Uh, and if you're curious, this is Andrew Lucia right here. This talk presents ongoing transdisciplinary research and design spanning across the fields of cell biology, material science, physics, fiber science, fashion, mechanical and structural engineering, and of course, architecture. And my collaborative research, teaching, and design practice focuses on the, con the contextual material and formal intersections between architecture, science, and emerging technologies. One of the fundamental questions uh, that guides our research is, how might buildings behave more like organisms, responding to and adapting to their built environments? To innovate responsive non-standard building skins, biobricks and tiles, and sentient spaces that are not only performative and functional, but generate what author Jenny O'Dell calls, quote, attention holding architecture, end quote. We integrate the premise that nature is resilient, not efficient into our thinking and processes analogically. And we embrace transdisciplinary design with a focus on problem and knowledge generation over immediate problem solving through collaborative design research processes that are emergent, transforming, and evolving for innovative applications across disciplines and disciplinary frameworks. With strong links to my lab here at AAP, the driving mission behind my practice, Jenny Saban Studio, which is adjacent to Purity Ice Cream, if you're curious, come by and visit us, is to create resilient, science-driven, and transformative spaces with and for diverse communities. And as friend and colleague Akam Mengus recently shared in conversation with my students, we need more research and practice and more practice in research. This interest probes the productive tinkering and deliberate misuse of digital fabrication machines frequently found in alternate industries, such as the textile industry and automotive industry, informed by issues of craft and making to produce biosynthetic material systems and software design tools that hopefully have the capacity to facilitate embedded expressions in our built environment. And this is polyform uh, just in front of the College of Human Ecology, which I'll come back to in just a moment. A seminal reference uh, for this work is the biological extracellular matrix, which is a dynamic protein network that physically and chemically couples the exterior environment of cells with their interior and vice versa. This matrix environment is a cell-derived woven and globular protein network that contacts most cells within the body. And as I came to learn early on in my collaboration uh, with Dr. Peter Lloyd-Jones uh, and his colleagues, this environment changes dynamically throughout development and disease. And so the big story here is that half the secret to life resides outside of the cell, 
So you have DNA or code, but that DNA is acted upon by external dynamic protein events. And so this presented to us a series of really powerful ecological design thinking models to bring back into architectural contexts in a rigorous way. This method of working across science, engineering, and architecture cultivates a biosynthetic design process where generated results are materialized as architecture, as demonstrator projects, capable of responding dynamically to both environment and to deeper interior program systems and circuits. As with eSkin, which was an early four-year research project uh, funded by the National Science Foundation that kicked off in 2010, our emphasis rests of heavily upon the study of natural and artificial ecology and design, especially in observing how cells interacting with pre-designed geometric patterns alter these patterns to generate new sur surface effects, specifically through structural color in the form of adaptive thin films for building skins. And this is some of the early work uh, in collaboration with Xu Yang, uh, who's a material scientist based uh, at Penn, uh, alongside mechanical engineers, uh, architects, and cell biologists. This is an example of a predefined geometric pattern uh, embedded within a shape memory polymer material, and it's displaying structural color change, uh, undergoing deformation and recovery. And so essentially what's happening is when I stretch this e-skin material, all of these pillars start to move from being normal or perpendicular to the surface uh, where they change their angles and in turn the behavior of light with that particular wavelength of that texture and pattern alters how it's being reflected and refracted and dynamically switches from opaque to transparent or displays uh, a, a gradient of color. And importantly, we perceive uh, that dynamic change within the material. So it's not pigment-based. It has everything to do with the behavior of light and human perception. Through this, we explored concepts of personalized architecture, such as the promise of generating windows on demand or adaptive frit patterning uh, at the scale of high-rise uh, buildings. And colleague Andrew Lucia uh, was very uh, much involved uh, with this early work. Running concurrently with this research uh, was the development of Polyform, um, as I just mentioned, uh, commissioned by the College of Human Ecology. Uh, the project integrates environment and community through advancements in computational design and contemporary digital fabrication techniques to generate a responsive and ornamented architectural intervention that hopefully envelops and activates daily routines and exchanges at the College of Human Ecology and beyond in the broader, in the broader Cornell campus. Structural color in this case uh, is achieved with a dichroic or wavelength dependent thin film uh, laminated to, to the tempered glass panels and is amplified through a generative design featuring complex porous folded geometries. And so we had an interesting opportunity here to test and apply uh, what we were engaged in, in in the context of fundamental research through that the Eskin NSF grant uh, with an actual project. And part of that ha had to do with the long duration of time uh, that it took to actually design, uh, build, and construct this. It's the longest running project in my practice. We started in 2013 and finally finished construction in 2021. And if you're curious, uh, the building permit for this project uh, in the state of New York uh, is a building shed. <laughs> so because it hovers between art and architecture, it's not a sculpture, you can inhabit it, uh, you can imagine that it presented a series of interesting hurdles to surpass uh, in the context of a university. So here, light reflecting uh, from and refracted onto the film uh, changes color and grows warmer or cooler, more opaque or transparent, and is not based on pigment, but how the film selectively interacts through interference or reinforcement of certain wavelengths of light at the microscopic scale. A key component uh, is how we perceive these subtle dramatic changes of light and color within the material itself. And these are some images uh, taken at, at dusk. In recent projects, uh, such as Convergence uh, by my practice uh, for the University of Nebraska Medical Center, uh, which we won by competition, 
We've explored responsive materials uh, coupled with advancements in robotic 3D printing uh, to celebrate, in this case, the thriving and rich heritage of excellence at the University of Nebraska Medical Center through materialized concepts that embed change, transformation, and contemplation. The largest 3D printed stainless steel structure in the world, uh, Convergence, or at least right now, I've been told, uh, Convergence builds upon the expanding field of architectural additive manufacturing through a really unique collaboration with Lincoln Electric. And working closely with Lincoln, uh, we, fabric we integrated fabrication constraints uh, such as scale of parts and maximum dra draft angle or overhang within the parts and all of this was integrated and optimized uh, in the final form finding process. At 28 feet in height and 12 feet in diameter, uh, Convergence pushes wire arc additive manufacturing uh, to the architectural scale, and in this case, uh, in an urban university context. Uh, this was the first time my practice closed down a public street. I was quite nervous at this moment as it was being elevated over a sky bridge. So through this unique WAM process, uh, over 4,000 pounds of robotically 3D printed stainless steel uh, were organized into nine unique printed panels. And the process uh, uniquely uses less uh, steel material than traditional fabrication methods, uh, thus reducing waste and saving time and labor. The project also features uh, non-standard uh, CNC machined polycarbonate panels. Uh, laminated with responsive, again, responsive wavelength dependent dichroic film. And to amplify the spatial presence of the project uh, through both equal and opposite forces, our form finding process included anchoring and balancing the structure on a single point uh, that meets the foundation uh, in the plaza, just to add a little bit more complexity uh, and nuance into the mix. And here's a, a photograph of the opening night um, within the plaza. In addition uh, to designing at the architectural scale uh, through demonstrator projects and experimental prototypes uh, with responsive materials that engage structural color and wavelength dependent properties, we frequently design and fabricate environments uh, that change and respond uh, to live dynamic data sets in real time. Uh, and this recent project uh, is cited in the new Google Bayview campus, uh, which was designed by Bjorka Ingalls Group, Big, and Heatherwick Studio in Mountain View, California. And Eddie and Shroud, uh, which are the projects that we contributed, are permanently installed uh, within the open architecture of the Bayview building. Eddie and Shroud engage with the undulating multi-tiered canopy system which is punctuated uh, by supporting columns, a staircase, and enclosed volumes. And to generate Eddie's form, thousands of reclaimed yarn spools are held in continuous tension uh, within a soft web of elastic fabric components and a 40-foot tall stainless steel diagrid structure. The structure wraps around and integrates with one of the columns uh, that supports the canopy system above to engage spatial connections with the entire Bayview building. Shroud, the smaller project, operates as a functional uh, threshold uh, to Courtyard 10, uh, which is where our projects are sited. And sharing material and formal strategies with Eddy, the shroud features a custom double membrane fabric structure tensioned within a connected series of undulating curved steel hoops that together envelop the stair. The de design process for both Eddy and shroud began uh, with a comprehensive site analysis um, and also uh, this included a structural analysis of both the column and the stair. And to engage the building elements fully, uh, the column was selected as a site of occupation uh, for Eddy, while the functional needs for a security gate at the stair entrance uh, frame the design intention for Shroud. The lighting system uh, is driven in real time by the flutter of live wind data uh, captured and integrated into a custom design software and hardware pipeline, allowing for a subtle spectacle of changing color, light, reflection, and shadow. 
Named after the physical phenomena of waves undulating across the grasslands, uh, Eddie playfully features a data-driven lighting system, uh, which, as I mentioned, is steered in real time by local environmental data. And we took inspiration uh, from the original biomes uh, that informed and inspired the parameters and zones that organize uh, the collaborative design by Big and Heatherwick uh, for the Bayview complex. And our focus uh, was upon the grassland biome associated with our specific courtyard. So in many ways, the project offers a, a second level presence uh, with both uh, enticing views, uh, beckoning Googlers, as, which was a new term to me uh, working on this project, uh, with its multi-sensory environment uh, while simultaneously offering a quiet space uh, for group meetings and informal creative work sessions. So in discerning which effects and materials are actually scalable, uh, my practice and research operates across three phases. Uh, we typically start um, with the development of tools. I like to think of software as a new type of material. Uh, these tools could be in the form of a, a custom script or an algorithm uh, based on, for example, a cellular data set uh, or a set of material properties. And then we move uh, some of those tools into the realm of architectural prototyping. Uh, and this is where we be begin to work with specific machines and strategies and methods for 3D printing, robotic fabrication, and so on. And also meaningfully and rigorously uh, managing uh, scale uh, and starting to productively contaminate uh, the process uh, with material constraints, uh, constraints of making, and architectural questions. And then finally, uh, some of those prototypes are moved into the realm of building ecology. Uh, so it's a, a purposefully slow process uh, to grapple uh, with the question of scale and to rigorously move across uh, these, these scale uh, leaps. So in addition to uh, working with adaptive and responsive materials, uh, we also work with non-standard uh, components uh, to investigate rapid manufacturing of full-scale 3D printed parts. Um, as was exemplified briefly um, in showing you the recent convergence project for UNMC. And we purchased our first 3D printer in 2009, and this was a part of Lab Studio uh, when I was still teaching at the University of Pennsylvania um, before coming here uh, with great excitement in 2011. Uh, and this was a powder-based printer, an old Z-Corp, uh, which is still in my lab. It's not working currently, but we keep trying to bring it back to life. Um, and at the time, it featured the largest uh, build bed on the market. And from the very beginning, I was interested in not using the 3D printer as a representational tool, uh, but leveraging it to rapidly manufacture um, components uh, that could then expand uh, beyond uh, the constraints of the build bed into much larger component-based assemblies. And in the context of Lab Studio, Peter and I were very interested in how prototyping scientific data uh, to hold data um, could positively influence the scientific process uh, to allow the scientists to project into their work uh, in new ways. And so it was during a very hot, muggy August summer uh, in 2009 when we were working on some prototypes for an exhibition at Seagraph that I started to tinker with this machine and realized that I literally had a body of material knowledge um, from my former life as a ceramic artist. I have a BFA in, in ceramics, as Wendy mentioned, that I could bring into a new context. And so this is a photograph of our first uh, successful batch of 3D printed greenware parts. Uh, so we took out the proprietary media, didn't tell Z Corp that we did that so that we wouldn't um, ruin our war war warranty mixed up a batch of high fire stoneware uh, with a little bit of maltodextrin uh, and uh, took out the adhesive and put in a solution of alcohol. Um, that's why there's a bottle of vodka in my lab. And uh, actually had a great deal of more success than I, than I thought and went from a $600 bucket of proprietary media uh, to $2.50 of material that you can uh, readily get off the shelf. So here you can see uh, the same part uh, printed in the regular media 
and then also printed in our high fire stoneware. Uh, it's been bisque fired, so chemically changed to ceramic, and then glaze fired. And so suddenly real material constraints, uh, such as shrinkage, uh, came into the fold. So this has led to a series of seminars uh, and option studios on the topic of digital ceramics, uh, representing uh, now well over a decade of, of research and teaching. Uh, and I've taught both option studios and seminars on this topic. And in my lab, we have focused on uh, the brick as an architectural element of investigation. Uh, I thought this was a very accessible point of departure, um, where now with the advent of 3D printing, every single brick uh, can be different as long as there's a coherent logic for how they're assembled. And we have the potential to think about uh, 3D printing on site uh, from local clay deposits uh, and really innovating uh, how we construct and design in a more integrated way. And this is Polybrick 1.0, uh, which colleague Martin Miller was very much a part of in the early days. A Polybrick 2.0 is based on um, integrating concepts and design drivers based on human bone formation, uh, working collaboratively with Dr. Christopher Hernandez uh, here in engineering. Um, he's a mechanical engineer with expertise in the mechanics of bone. Uh, I won't be talking about this in depth, uh, but we have a slew of really amazing peer-reviewed papers that you can download and uh, read at your leisure. What I will talk about more in depth um, tonight is our recent work uh, with Polybrick uh, 3.0. Uh, so we've gone back down in scale, um, but this project uh, focuses on the question, how might we rethink building materials through 3D printing and biologically informed design? Uh, this is a multi-year collaborative project uh, with, together with Dr. Dan Lau. Uh, who's in biological and environmental engineering uh, here at Cornell. We've been collaborating now uh, for over a decade. And Dan is doing incredible work with 3D printed hydrogels infused with specific DNA sequences uh, to program uh, materials. So in recent research experiments uh, in my lab, this mode of bio-informed thinking has now expanded to designing uh, with life uh, through DNA-steered ceramic materials and living glazes uh, with dynamic feedback mechanisms. The work reflects upon uh, new questions of adaptive and live materials in architecture through the integration of advanced processes in additive manufacturing with cutting-edge research and DNA hydrogel development. Synthetically designed uh, with advanced bioengineering, the prototypes utilize 3D printed clay, hydrogel, and synthetic DNA. And specifically, we're exploring programmable biofunctionalities uh, in our constructed architectural environments through the development of these advanced ceramic biotiles. DNA, uh, which is known as the information storage molecule for biological systems, is also a known material for engineering. So the first phase of our research uses DNA uh, to design directly with light, uh, where unique signatures fluoresce uh, within the polybrick uh, clay body. So I think you can see a, a common theme in terms of how uh, we're working dynamically with both light and energy uh, to directly engage with these responsive and adaptive materials. Specifically, we're working with a DNA sequence uh, based on Luciferous, or the magical firefly. Uh, the input energy is ATP, and the output energy is light. This enables cell-free production of light on ceramic tiles. In polytile 2.0, uh, which builds upon uh, this work, uh, we're taking this to the next level in that we are working at the typical scale of an architectural tile. And these tiles utilize uh, both 3D printed patterning techniques uh, to steer um, how the tiles are fluorescing with these novel bioengineered hydrogel materials to tune surface conditions and effects at both the micro and macro scales. So imagine a wall that not only alerts you to local contaminants or particulate matter in the local environment through the emission of light, but then cleans that local environment through chemical and biological interactions. 
In many ways, DNA nanotechnology will open new possibilities for creating nano to macro scale materials and architectural elements that can dynamically react to environmental cues and interact with both biochemical and even human reactions. So our current phase, as I mentioned, is focusing on responses uh, to local environment. I'm gonna share one video that summarizes the various phases of polybrick uh, with some more visuals. The production of ceramic blocks and tiles has a long technological and design history. Ceramic modules of standard measurement have been used as building block and replacement of stone for many centuries. Ceramic bricks and tiles, so ubiquitous in their application in the built environment, have surprisingly lacked recognition as a viable building component in contemporary architecture practice until now. Polybrick, our latest endeavor under the topic of digital ceramics in the Sabin Design Lab at Cornell University, showcases next steps in the integration of complex phenomena. This work includes advances in digital technology, 3D printing, advanced geometry, and material practices in arts, crafts, and design disciplines. The first phase of the Polybrick series features the use of algorithmic design techniques for the digital fabrication and production of non-standard ceramic brick components for the mortarless assembly and installation of the first fully 3D printed and fired ceramic brick componentry. Polybrick 2.0 is generated with the rules, principles, and behavior of human bone formation. This allows for the production of variegated bricks that are light and porous at the top of the wall and dense at the base to carry load and maintain efficient structural integrity while also amplifying material and formal expressions. Polybrick 3.0 takes our material investigations to the next level. Synthetically designed with advanced bioengineering, these biobricks will exemplify the cutting edge and future of biologically steered clay and ceramic building blocks in architecture. The two prototypes utilize 3D printed clay, hydrogel, and synthetic DNA. As you can see here, a unique ID stamped with DNA in the form of a C for Cornell is fluorescing within the polybrick clay body. Brick stamping has a long history where variegated size, shape, and stamping indicate place, date of construction, and type, and thus serve as invaluable historical documents. With our unique DNA stamps and glaze, we explore the possibility of live signatures and dynamic surface techniques, coupled with non-standard bricks in the context of living matter and digital ceramics. So this second um, applied project that I will go uh, and to a bit more depth on, uh, builds upon over a, a decade of work testing how these biologically informed concepts uh, and adaptive materials uh, can be applied experimentally in architecture uh, to engage with diverse communities in, in urban contexts. And this, these projects have built upon uh, several built examples. Uh, since 2012, we have been able to deepen and apply our ongoing research on these responsive materials uh, to engage the dynamics of light and energy, uh, such as structural color, um, as I described. And in this time, through high-tech uh, solar active and photoluminescent responsive fibers, uh, which commenced uh, with a commission uh, from Nike uh, that resulted in a, a pavilion uh, called MyThread uh, for the Nike Flyknit uh, Collective. 
Uh, following several uh, new projects, including polythread uh, for the Cooper Hewitt design triennial in 2016, uh, we were able to take this work uh, to an urban scale uh, with our winning entry Lumen uh, for MoMA and MoMA PS1's Young Architects program, uh, and this is, was in 2017. Uh, the project features over 18,000 square feet of digitally knit porous uh, canopy structures uh, that are held in tension within the existing matrix of courtyard walls um, at MoMA PS1 in Long Island City. It also features three 42-foot uh, tall tensegrity towers and an interactive misting system uh, that uh, worked quite effectively in cooling uh, the underside of the canopy during the hot summer months of 2017, uh, and robotically wound spool stools uh, for seating. And this was also importantly the first time uh, that we were able to test uh, our high-tech responsive fiber knit material system uh, with actual context and the changing conditions of the environment and path of the sun. In a recent project uh, for an innovative developer, Imcan, in Abu Dhabi in the UAE, uh, we were commissioned to design and produce a permanent public beach activation project. Um, there's not a lot of public space uh, in the UAE, and Abu Dhabi is really doing some amazing work uh, to remedy that. So this is a public beach activation project. And this time we collaborated with Gore, uh, who uh, developed Gore-Tex, uh, to develop an entirely new photoluminescent EPTFE material uh, that can withstand the extreme climate of uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, including sand and windstorms. And these are just a few details of uh, some of those responses. So going back to Lumen uh, for just a moment, our collaborative work also includes a significant human component, uh, both in how it is made uh, through a hybrid of analog and digital design processes, and also through the active engagement with uh, communities in architectural and, and urban contexts. Uh, and this was during one of the warm-up events uh, every Saturday. Incredible DJs and artists were invited to perform uh, and close to 7,000 people every Saturday uh, inhabited and enjoyed uh, Lumen. I found these, these days incredibly stressful, um, but the project held up and did quite well um, for the four months that it, was, that it was up. So this last project um, that I will present, I'm gonna go a little bit more in depth on um, uh, to describe a number of these concepts and methods and, and material strategies. Uh, that we have developed over the years um, and have had opportunities to apply uh, in larger experimental projects. Uh, this is ADA, uh, which is a project by Jenny Sabin Studio, and it's in collaboration with Microsoft Research. And it also co-evolved in a transdisciplinary context. And in many ways, a transdisciplinary practice uh, can provide both collective and democratic solutions uh, to important questions around technology and big data uh, to hopefully enable new forms of access, well-being, and agency. In conjunction with this work, uh, we're exploring how artificial intelligence, AI, uh, can personalize rooms and buildings. In many ways, the spaces and environments uh, that people inhabit influence how we feel and how we act. So working with researchers and engineers at Microsoft Research, ADA is driven by both individual and collective sentiment data uh, that's collected and housed uh, within the Microsoft Research Building, uh, Building 99 on their home Redmond campus in Washington State. And the project is named after the polymath mathematician, uh, first computer programmer and early innovator of the computer age, Ada Lovelace. And in many ways, the collaborative project um, with MSR embodies performance, material innovation, human-centered adaptive architecture, and emerging technologies. And we believe this is the first architectural pavilion project uh, to incorporate uh, AI in the, the sense of live, real-time updates uh, that actuated the materials uh, that make up ADA. So through the integration of responsive materials and emerging technologies, the project has the capacity to hopefully promote and increase well-being in healthy environments as a demonstrator project, 
through people's direct engagement with its architecture. Uh, the pavilion itself is composed of both responsive and data-driven tubular uh, and cellular components, all digitally knit, uh, held in continuous tension uh, via 3D printed semi-rigid exoskeleton, uh, which is composed of over 895 unique 3D printed nylon nodes. Uh, the lighting system and materials uh, of the cyber phys physical architecture respond to human participation specifically, as I mentioned, as individual and collective facial uh, pattern data, uh, which are collected through a network of cameras, processed by AI algorithms, uh, and transmitted as sentiment uh, through light and color. So working collaboratively, uh, we designed and programmed the software uh, architecture for two programs, uh, which allow Ada to interface uh, with human sentiment uh, in her environment. So an important uh, aim of the project is to expand and inspire architectural engagement with humans. While artificial intelligence uh, powers the project uh, through the precise narrowing and statistical averaging of data uh, collected from both individual and collective facial patterns and voice tones, the architecture of Ada augments emotion through aesthetic experience, thereby opening the range of possible human emotional engagement. In turn, the project hopefully opens new pathways for fundamental research on the use of AI to correlate connections between human sentiment and local environment. And the project is being actively used um, today by Microsoft researchers where they can also integrate um, multiple types of, of live data streams. So in many ways, personalized architecture may sense subtle changes in human emotion uh, through sensors and interfaces that detect changes in facial patterns and voice tones and respond in ways that increase and hopefully promote, increase well-being and hopefully promote healthier environments. Ada offers subtle and abstract interactions uh, with humans through space, material, and form to augment and expand our emotional range in a specific context, in this case, an office environment, uh, which in turn affects the probable sentiment data being collected as new information within that field. The spaces and environments that we inhabit influence and partially shape who we are and how we are feeling. And through the integration of responsive materials and emerging technologies, Ada hopefully offers an interface for personalizing architecture to make it more human and reflexive. At the same time, Ada expands human emotional engagement through beauty and materiality. It's a demonstrator project showcasing the capacity and future of architecture to promote and increase well-being through the direct engagement with the spaces that we inhabit. In many ways, transdisciplinary design is about connections and synergies not about sole authorship across science, technology, and architecture, steered by the systemic and relational conditions of life, from DNA to sentiment as future adaptive and intelligent materials and the optimism of possibility. Through the integration of biological adaptations, DNA steered materials, and emerging technologies, the future, future will bring building tiles that emit light, rooms that sense and respond to the well-being of their occupants, and cellular building skins that collect and store energy. This is where you can find us. Um, I've just presented a few of our projects, uh, and we've been very fortunate to receive generous funding over the years uh, from industry partners, uh, clients, foundations, and federal granting agencies. And we do have a number of papers um, on the lab, lab website uh, if you're curious about taking a deeper dive uh, into any one of these projects. So with that, I've been talking for about 45 minutes, which is more than enough. Um, thanks so much for coming out on a beautiful sunny evening. And I'm, I'm really happy to take questions uh, from those of you online on Zoom or here in the auditorium. So feel free to put questions in the chat or just unmute yourself. Jenny, maybe I should lead off while people are formulating their questions. Sure. I'd love to hear a lot more, but maybe you can just 
answer a little, like, about the path that you came to this work. Um, like, you mentioned your background in ceramics, and then dot, 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 this amazing work. Can you say a little bit about how you got from there to here? Yeah, sure. Um, well, it's been, it's been a process, uh, for sure. Um, I started uh, my undergraduate days in biochemistry. I think that was my rebellion against my parents, who are both artists, and, uh, and then quickly realized that that wasn't the path I wanted to go down and um, ended up um, pursuing ceramics and inter interdisciplinary visual arts. But I, I always struggled with, like many of us, um, trying to find that, that perfect mix of the creative arts uh, and design and, and the sciences and mathematics. And that eventually led me to pursue my graduate work in architecture. Um, I specifically went to Penn because they were called the Graduate School of Fine Arts in 2001. Um, their name has changed three times, I think, since then. But I foolishly thought I could do maybe a MFA in painting and an MARC. No way. Um, but I, I was fortunate to go to school, to graduate school during a really interesting time uh, when Penn was sort of transitioning into the digital and grappling with uh, new pedagogi pedagogical models around that. And so I was fortunate to spend the first half of my graduate education learning the, the sort of traditions of architectural design, uh, drawing and methodologies, ink on mylar, all those techniques. Uh, and then the second half, uh, scripting and studying with people like Cecil Baumond and just this explosion of, of new possibilities and um, generative design and algorithmic and algorithmically informed design really was that glove. I was like, oh my goodness, wow, this is incredible. Um, and I was an older student. Uh, I, I did well, and I was invited to teach shortly after I graduated. And that was one of those phone calls you, you'll never forget, uh, where the chair at the time, Detlef Mertens, gave me a call and said, Jenny, do you want to teach first year and then co-teach an option studio with Cecil in the spring? And I said, yes. Um, and that, that opened up... Uh, possibilities for starting a research agenda that was formalized through Lab Studio. Um, and I guess maybe the last thing I'll say is that as we, the architects, were grappling with these new things we were seeing on our computer screens and coming up with, with words to describe the, the complex forms that were emerging, we were borrowing terms from the sciences, complexity, emergence, uh, and other, you know, topics. And I, I, I was sort of I, productively critical about that, and I thought maybe we could learn a little bit more about these concepts from our scientific colleagues. And I happened to meet Peter very uh, serendipitously uh, through a conference um, that I co-organized, uh, which was a part of the Nonlinear Systems Organization. And he wandered in and was like, what are these architects doing with nonlinear systems? And he stayed the entire day and came up to me afterwards, and that opened a whole conversation. So that's my sort of long answer to, or short, somewhat long answer to a very long path. <laughs> Thank you so much. Questions? We have a question in, in the auditorium. Hi, um, thank you for this presentation. It's super interesting. Um, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about timelines and time in general. Um, it sounds like a lot of your original interests kind of sparked in uh, probably really early in your life. And I think a lot of times like research feels like it takes forever and is just iterative, generative. It, it can go on and on and on. And the projects that you produce then kind of put a stake in your timeline that they are completed as an installation, but can you talk a little bit more about uh, the day-to-day -day kind of from an idea all the way into perhaps an installation and then ongoing, what is the timeline and what does it look like? Yeah, great question, thank you. Um, the, the timelines and sort of day-to-day -day work are very different between the lab and my studio practice. Um, 
you know, in, in the lab, we may have four years of funding to take a deep dive into a, a single concept, um, such as the work that I presented that we're doing with Dan Lau. Uh, we're doing some amazing work uh, with colleagues that are part of the new uh, Institute for Living Materials with yeast and, and remediation of formaldehyde. So that's a much slower kind of steady um, pace uh, in terms of the production of the work. And, and in the studio, it really depends on the project uh, and it depends on, on the client and uh, the constraints that we're up against. And like typical architectural commissions, we have budget, budgetary constraints and, um, yeah, and, de and, and deadlines that we have to meet. Um, and there isn't always a literal direct one-to-one one -one connection between what we're doing in the, the lab and what we're doing in the practice, but there's always very strong conceptual links. Um, and oftentimes the methods will influence how we, we tackle something in the practice. So for example, with convergence, while I had not taken on wire arc additive manufacturing in the lab, we considered it with Frank and, the, and the, our incredible shop staff, but realized that was not gonna be possible in our shop. Um, but we had done a lot of years of 3D, print, 3D printing and paste-based printing with clay. So we were able to take that knowledge and, and really apply it at a, an altogether different scale. Um, and then in terms of collaboration, oftentimes it starts with a conversation with colleagues and we discover, you know, some, some common interests and, and that then will move into a more formal uh, collaboration through funding and, and sharing students and um, finding ways to, to co-teach. But it's, I won't say that this has been an easy path um, because in our various disciplines, we do things differently. We, we publish differently, we garner funds differently, we t teach diff diff different schedules. I mean, my incredible colleagues in the sciences are amazed by how much we teach, <laughs> right? The, the studio uh, context. Um, so figuring out how to break those barriers down and, and, and truly collaborate and teach uh, collaboratively is, is is difficult, and I think that's one incredible opportunity that we have with the new multi-college department as a kind of truly lateral tissue that will not only uh, cut across departments in AAP, but importantly reaching out into, into the university. Jenny, there is a question in the meeting chat from Mark Feldman. Could you speak a bit about the possibilities of building skins uh, that breathe, react, and purify, and, and other possibilities? Great question. Um, so with the e-skin project, which is an older project, uh, we, were, we could have looked at a number of different uh, parameters and, and characteristics, but we chose to focus on, on structural color, uh, as I mentioned. And we were projecting that we could eventually develop a thin film technology that could be applied as, as for example, an adaptive frit patterning. So frit patterning on high-rise buildings um, is, is static and it blocks a certain amount of UV light uh, to therefore reduce the overall carbon uh, footprint and heat gain of the building. Uh, but imagine if that frit patterning could change you know, throughout the, the day. Um, we had some pretty big hurdles uh, to negotiate with scalability uh, in the eSkin project, um, both in terms of cost and also just the labor involved uh, with fabricating uh, the material. Uh, and I know my colleague Uli um, has, has definitely negotiated some of these questions in, in his collaborative work. But we're in very early days with a new a uh, project funded by the NSF um, with colleagues in uh, plant science, um, biomedical engineering, uh, and uh, cell biology, architecture, and uh, mechanical engineering uh, that's part of the NSF directorate to 
hopefully distill a rule of life uh, across multiple uh, systems, uh, including uh, plants, uh, the brain, um, and, and, and cell biology. And, and through that process of visualization and modeling uh, the various data across those systems, we hope to distill a set of design drivers that we can then apply uh, towards architectural assemblies uh, that can respond in real time with their local contexts. Whether or not those will breathe um, and purify, we're, we're, not, we're not quite there yet, um, but we're really excited to kick off with, with that project, which just started last fall. I, I had a question as well. You spoke on this briefly, but I was just wondering, as the title of the lecture, Transdisciplinary Design, suggests, I think one of the really interesting things and something that makes the work successful is the partnerships with other stakeholders and professors, et cetera. So I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit about how you begin to cultivate those relationships with the professors and the fabricators, but also with the stakeholders and the clients that you're building these projects for? Yeah, thank you, Lucas. Um, yeah, again, I, it oftentimes starts with a, a conversation and uh, it's it, it really depends on the, the context. So if I start with industry partnerships, um, the collaboration with Lincoln Electric uh, came out of, you know, a desire to really push the possibilities of scale with robotic additive manufacturing and working with with steel, um, but knowing that you know we couldn't do that in house uh, for a number of reasons, and and so I contacted both Lincoln Electric uh, and a couple of other industry outfits that are engaged in that specific type of fabrication. And we had a, a series of conversations and, and then it, it really became a, about fit and excitement and, um, and also cost. Uh, there were some examples that were just absorbently cost prohibitive. Um, but really the important thing was about fit and, and really coming together and, and um, on some sort of common ground and, and shared excitement about doing the project together. Um, I think more substantially, my collaborations with colleagues in engineering and, and the sciences, sometimes it, uh, things will develop through um, sharing students. Um, I think when my lab is, is populated with students, um, not only with you know, architecture students, but engineering students, students from material science, uh, plant biology, and, and beyond. It's the most sort of vital and exciting uh, time. And that also, by default, creates new connections with, with colleagues across, across the campus. Um, and then I think now that I've been here at Cornell for 12 years, there are synergies that have developed um, where, you know, we, we know each other and, so for example, the, the, the new Institute for Living and Engineered uh, Material, uh, there are just a lot of kind of common interests and synergies around like what is the future of, of living material and, and how do we really begin to grapple with that in our, our built environments, both technologically, um, architecturally, uh, and, and also in the case of, of the faculty involved with design tech. Um, sort of big thinkers, uh, not bound by their disciplinary silos, um, reaching out and, and really pushing boundaries. Uh, so it, it depends. Sometimes it's like, who do I need to talk to to get this done? And who's doing the most amazing work in this space? Um, or, wow, I never thought about yeast that way before. <laughs> and it you know, creates uh, possibility. Thank you. Yeah. I see Tao. Your hand is up. Yes. Uh, hi, Jenny. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Tao. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure if there might have been a, a, a question in the chat before my hand. So, um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll lower my hand. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jenny. That was um, really amazing to 
um, to see your work. Um, uh, and um, I have a, a question that it might, um, I'm not quite sure exactly how it might um, emerge or how to formulate it, but um, there, there was something really amazing about the, um, about color, even just the slides, as you showed them, I could imagine it, you know, seeing the projects um, in person. Um, uh, but there's something about your approach that I'm curious about, um, and uh, perhaps uh, you, you're working very closely with um, with scientists, uh, and in in the realm of the natural sciences, there's typically um, certain assumptions about the nature of reality, um, and um, typically it, it carries with it a certain materialistic conception of um, of the world within which we live in order for science to, to go about its tasks. Um, but in your projects, and I'm thinking maybe on, on the one hand, um, like Eddie and Fraud, uh, as you were talking about it, it, it reminded me of, um, of characters I remember from childhood, uh, 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 carnival characters called Tantan and Saga Boy. They were kind of archetypical um persons um and um the the um the, the technologies you used um and the kind of bioinformed technologies there um uh, that, that seem to relate from what to to poly brick, brick three suggest a certain kind of possibility for I don't, um the animation of the environment here is kind of literal, almost that there is a, that it, that it's alive in a certain sense, or the limits of what one might consider life. But on the other hand, um, maybe thinking about Ada um, and your 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 discourse around the work seems to always leave open a certain idea of freedom of the human condition, I guess. Um, I, I mean that in the sense of um, that um, that things are not um, deterministically, uh, materialistically determined in a certain way. There's a possibility for freedom and one, all, one typically associates that question with, with myth, with, um, with, with theology. Um, ideas of the uh, of the soul on the one hand, or the insold on the other hand. Um, so, uh, and and you you sort of leave room for that. It seems always. Um, and I wonder, um, would you could if the question is intelligible, first of all, <laughs> but secondly, um, could you uh, speak? Um, to something like that, something like the, the or, or your your approach to that, um, a certain limit as to what the, the the technological, the biological, the scientific, a certain limit as to what is achievable that always allows for that seems to at least in the way that you speak about the work, allow for something like feeling, like emotion, like uh, those things that characterize um, what one might call. Um, certain notions of human freedom, you might say. Thank you, Tao. It was beautiful. I'm going to ask you to write my afterword for my next book. <laughs> um, really wonderful. I, yeah, maybe I'll answer or, or attempt to just have a conversation with a couple of different points around the topics that you bring up. I mean, maybe you noticed that I started and ended my presentation with um, a data output from our collaborative work with Down, but it's in the form of, a, of an infinity sign. Uh, and there's, a, I think, a, an openness to the work, which we're really testing uh, in the scale built projects that is never quite complete um, and is, is certainly um, not fully materialized and, until it is inhabited and engaged with by by humans. And and maybe to be a bit more specific with with Lumen, I wish I wish I had actually done like a proper post occupancy analysis because 
I was, I was really blown away by how people took ownership of the project. And they would come up to me and say, you know, I, I come here every week to take my lunch because I feel calm here. Or I wish this, this type of work was in my child's play, playground. Or I wish this was uh, in our local hospital. So there, there's something about the work that is not a direct, you know, mimicking of biological cells into architectural form, but there's a synthesis of dynamic processes and behaviors informed by deep, rigorous, multi-year, in that case, an analysis of surface design in cellular morphogenesis, but then, you know, translated across multiple questions and um, constraints of materials and, and responsive engagement, where a materiality in a spatial sense is, is co-produced by people's engagement with, with the project. So there aren't strict borders or boundaries. You know, it's soft, it's undulating, it's constantly changing. Um, and that as a, as a kind of open thesis for a body of work is what I'm really deeply interested in. And, and it, we touch important issues of sustainability and performance through the way that we work, but I'm equally interested and invested in the human component of it. Um, delight, wonder, inspiring a moment of pause in one's, one's day, um, inspiring uh, a way of sort of thinking about something differently. So. And that's, that also it influences the types of materials and responses that we work with, which brings in the color and, yeah. But thank you, Tao. Really beautiful uh, summary. Thank you, Jenny. Um, I'm mindful of time. I think there are two, two more questions in the chat. Uh, what would be your advice and suggestion for students who would want to explore transdisciplinary design and build their career beyond one design domain? In 2023-24, we'll have our first admission cycle for the new MS in design tech. <laughs> so consider uh, entering and applying to that, that program. Um, but that's one way. Um, but I, I also think another way uh, for those students in the room and online uh, is, is to push yourself into environments that are maybe are a little bit uncomfortable, that are not familiar to you. Um, venture out of, of AAP, or if you're an engineering venture, out of uh, the engineering buildings. Uh, attend other uh, seminars uh, and symposia. There was a really great student symposium last night um, as part of the, the Engineered Living Matter group um, that brought students from all different types of departments and, and areas. So that's my biggest piece of advice to you is just push yourself out into unfamiliar territory and strike up some interesting conversations. And then the last question, um, I wonder how easy it would be, it would be to, to possibly adapt such high tech techniques, which are amazing uh, to a more marginated context like Latin America. Uh, would it be possible to generate similar iterations uh, with more affordable or accessible materials or machines? Really a fantastic question. Um, I mean, I would love uh, to collaborate. I mean, some aspects of the Polybrick project, as I mentioned very briefly, have uh, looked at uh, working, you know, on site, on construction sites uh, with machines where we could potentially, you know, work with local clay deposits. That's one way uh, to start to think about it. Um, there are certainly uh, amazing colleagues, colleagues of mine here at AAP in architecture. Uh, Leslie Locke just led, uh, as many of you know, a really amazing Preston Thomas Symposium, uh, looking at urban rural uh, conditions, uh, primarily in, in China, and how bringing these cutting edge technologies into those contexts can be really impactful and, and innovative. And I would say some of the most amazing examples um, that I have seen that address your question uh, bring together um, people who have expertise uh, in local craft-based uh, construction technologies uh, with 
experts uh, in these innovative digital uh, fabrication uh, technologies. Um, thinking of the work of Ron Rail and Virginia Sanfratello, for example, um, you know, really pushing scale with robotic printing, but working with Adobe uh, materials and more traditional vernacular uh, architectural strategies. So I think, I think your question is really, really timely, and um, there's loads of potential to collaborate and and bring these different communities and contexts together. So I think, unless there's one last question in person, um, we will come to a close. Sound good, Wendy? Sounds good. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming out on a beautiful evening um, and for attending our last Design Tech Talk. Uh, look for us in the fall um, and watch for updates on the new department uh, and new programs uh, coming online. Thank you. And thanks, Wendy, for emceeing. <laughs>